I agree with Alan, there are many kinds of Muslims. There are many, many kinds of Muslims and there are many, many interpretations of Islam. There are many Islams, many maternities, but there is only one Quran. It doesn't matter whether it is a Shia or a Sunni, whether it's a Salafi or a Sufi, whether it is an Indian Muslim or a Pakistani Muslim or an American Muslim, we all are reading the same Quran. We may read different things in the Quran, but we are reading the same text. Uh, it is the same. It has always been the same. So you can just walk into any store, walk onto any website, and you will find the same Quran. So I thought that one of the ways to cut across this diversity, you know, people like to say that Islam is a monotheistic religion, but not a monolithic community. So yes, but so I thought, why not start with the Quran? So I'm trying to do something very difficult today. I'm going to try and explain to you or provide one explanation of Islam based on only two verses of the Quran. And I have shared those with you on the flyer. They are 190, 191st verses from the third chapter of the Quran. The third chapter is called Al Imran or the family of Jesus. So the chapter is from the family of Jesus. It, is, it talks about Mary, Jesus, uh, even Joseph and Zachariah in that chapter, and may peace be upon all of them. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard wa khtilaf al-layli wa nahari la ayat lil ulil al-ba. Al-lazina yaskurun Allah khiyamu wa qudamu wa ada junubihim wa yatafakkaruna fi khalqi samawati wal ard. ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار. So these two verses say very simply that indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth, this world and the other, when the Quran says heavens, it means the other world, the invisible world, the spiritual world, the world of angels. And when the Quran says the earth, it means this world, the material world that you and I as human beings can perceive. So indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth, in the changing of the night and the day are signs for people of intellect. So God is saying in the Quran that look at the world around you as the world changes. There are signs for those who have intellect. And in the creation of this world also there are signs. And who are these people of intellect that God is addressing? These people of intellect, these ulul al bab are those who meditate on Allah who remember Allah, who think of Allah while they are standing, while they are sitting, and while they are lying on their sides, and reflect on the creation of this world and the other. Our Lord, you have not created this universe without any purpose, but as proof of the totality of your greatness. This world that God created, it hasn't been created without any purpose. It is to manifest the various attributes and qualities of God. This creation mirrors the greatness of God. So when we look at this universe, when we focus on this universe, when we reflect on this universe, it is a meditation. Whether you're sitting in the temple or the mountain or the mosque and remembering God, or you're sitting in a laboratory and trying to figure out when time began, you are doing the same thing. You are either remembering God or you are meditating on His creation. But what you are doing in either of the two cases is trying to understand the greatness of God. And finally God says, glory be to Himself and ask us to pray that He saves us from fire. Now these two verses in my, my understanding of Islam to a great extent explain to you what Islam is and also answer some metaphysical questions. The most mysterious question that all of us address regardless of our faith and regardless of our belief in a deity is why do we exist and why does this creation exist? And God answers that to say that I have not created this in vain. I have created this with a purpose which is to manifest myself. In a tradition God says, I was a hidden treasure and I wanted to be known, I wanted to be loved. So I created a sentient being who could know me, who could love me. In one tradition he establishes the purpose of the existence, which is self-discovery of God, his manifestation of his divinity. In Arabic we say tajalliyat, 
God is manifesting his character as the world unfolds. We have seen very little of this universe. We know very little of our God. The more we understand this universe, the more we will know God. And that is the purpose of this creation that God is saying. But he has created us. So God wants to see this universe through our eyes. He sees himself through us. And he loves us so that we love him. And that is the purpose of this creation. So as a Muslim, when I read these verses, I realize that the spectrum of diversity in Islam moves from the heart to the mind. That is it. These are the boundaries of Islam. And all Muslims fall between that. At one extreme, you are a Sufi who has submitted his entire heart to God. And all you do is whether you are sitting, whether you are standing, whether you are lying down, whether you are awake or whether you are sleeping, you pray. I know some Muslim colleagues who even in their sleep they pray because they dream of praying. <coughs> They actually dream that they are praying. And these are not scholars or ordinary people who have shared it with me. So they are, when they are conscious, they are praying. When they are unconscious, they are praying. So at one extreme, we have the heart connected, contemplating upon God. So all the mystical traditions of Islam head in that direction. The sole purpose of existence is to connect with God before you connect with God. That is, you die before you die. To, to find decisive evidence of God's existence and make that connection with God while you're alive. That is the pursuit of mysticism. And that is what it's about the heart. Yes, Kurun Allah, those who remember Allah while standing, while sitting, while sleeping, all the time. If you, if you, it's like being in love. Imagine one of my students just falls in love. You think he or she is going to listen to my lectures. They're sitting there in the class, but their heart is with their beloved. They're dreaming of their beloved. They're thinking of what she said, he said, what am I going to say? It's like that. They're completely lost. When I had my son, I have one son, I was walking around on campus as a grad student looking foolish with a smile on my face because I was constantly thinking of him. And several people would stop me and say, so you are in love. I said, yeah, but you're getting it wrong. It's <laughs> so, so a mystic is like that, constantly remembering God. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the philosopher, the scientist, who wants to know God, who is thinking constantly about God. His connection with God is not through the heart, but his connection with God is through his mind. In Arabic, they are called arifin, those who know. A Pakistani poet, a very famous poet called Iqbal said, خودی کو کر بلند اتنا کہ ہر تقدیر سے پہلے خدا خود بندے سے پوچھے کہ بتا تیری رضا کیا ہے This is an old poem. He says that elevate yourself so high that God even before he writes his destiny he asks you what should I write? What do you want the future to be? But what Irban is telling is this that the power of the mind the believer of the mind has made him a confidant of God. So he's so close to God, and his connection is so intellectual that God is willing to share his secrets with his believer. So whatever kind of Muslim you are, you fall in this spectrum. Either you are the beloved of God, or you are the seeker of God's secrets. There are many books in Islamic tradition called Sir al Asra, Secret of Secrets, as if these guys have shared some of them. But when you read the book, and if you have the heart of the believer, you will see their secrets in the secrets. And sometimes I have, my mind was blown when I read some of these books, and I said, wow, I would never have thought of this. Surely God is sharing with us. It's like Newton figuring out gravity. We all experienced gravity before Newton, but he, it's with him that God decided to share that important secret. So that is what the diversity of Islam is. Now, if you look at these verses of the Quran, I'm sure a lot of Muslims have read them, understood them quite differently. When the Prophet, these verses are revealed to him, he used to recite them every night before his sleep. And when he recited them alone in the mosque, he used to cry. Because he understood what they meant, that I can approach my Lord in many ways. 
One path starts from the heart and one path starts from the mind. Now there are two kinds of people. Those who belong to time and those to whom time belongs. Let me repeat that. <laughs> there are two kinds of people. Those who belong to time. Time owns them. And then there are those to whom time belongs. So for example, we are all modern people. We belong to modern age. Some of us are postmodern. The postmodern era is about to dawn. Some of us mentally are medieval. <laughs> Have you followed the presidential debates? <laughs> right? The past still owns them. Right? So you belong to a time. So you manifest certain intellectual characteristics. Some value preferences that belong to a historical period in time. So we say we belong to that time. And then there are other ways of talking about time, like saying, in the time of Prophet Muhammad. Now suddenly you see Muhammad owns the time. So right now we are living in the age of the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad owns time now. Even though, and everybody writes, it's Jesus Christ who owns the time, right? 2016 is what? <laughs> it's the time is from the time that Jesus died. So, in that sense, but a simpler way of understanding this distinction that I'm trying to make is to look at it from the perspective of nature and nurture. Are we capable of transforming our social context or are we determined by our social context? It's like saying, is it necessary that if I make less than $40,000, I will vote Democratic and if I make more than $4 million, I will vote Republican? <laughs> Or is it possible that I might be a billionaire, but I might still have a heart and want to do something for the poor people? May want to see that everybody has health. Are we able, the question really is, can we transcend our material and socioeconomic conditions? Marx said we could not. He said it very profoundly. He said it is our it's our material conditions that shape our political consciousness, and it's not that our political consciousness shapes our material conditions. That Marxism is all about that we are determined by the time we live in. But then others believe that, no, we can shape it. That's why we have prophets, etc., who can come and transform societies. So why am I getting into the philosophical argument? I believe that most people are children of their time, and most people are produced by the social structure, the political structure, the economic structure that they are born in. So when you look at Muslims, whether they are living today in Syria and Iraq, or whether they are living in Washington, D.C., or they are living on the West Coast, you cannot expect them to be identical. How can somebody who is driving home in a Jaguar and is suddenly thrilled that the stock market is going up again and this today I made $60,000 because it's gone up by one point, how can that person's consciousness, that person's political choices, be the same as someone who went out looking for bread and came back and did not find his or her house? All his children are dead. Somebody blew it up. How can you expect that individual to have the same ethical and moral standard as somebody who's living a comfortable life? So in many ways, when you see these different manifestations of Islam and Muslims, when people read the same verse of the Quran and one says this authorizes me, in fact demands that I kill all those who disagree with me, and another person reads the same verse and says what this tells me is that I have to sacrifice myself in order to transcend myself. You understand? You have to kill your identity in order to transcend yourself to become one with God. So in the same verses people can read. So when we look at the Muslim world and we look at different manifestations of Islam, you must realize that it is not by choice that they become who they are. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, I want to grow up and become a terrorist. That is not their, an option, that is not their choice, there is not a desire. What every Muslim thinks is that I want to do what I can do to come as close to God as possible. Now, it's the path they choose is the path that their socio-political context provides. 
So when we want to have a socio-political impact on Muslims who choose violence as an option, we have to ensure that we change the context in which they live. If people are choosing violence because they face violence, throwing more violence at them is not the solution. And this is very important. We never ask these questions about ourselves. We are far more violent than any part of the Muslim world. Shooting in Kalamazoo the day before yesterday, in Kansas today, and so on and so forth. We are so used to it that it doesn't even affect us. It has no impact on public policy, it has no impact on electoral, nothing. Extensive daily violence. It's like, if we call it terrorism, then we would be having more terrorism than even Iraq and Syria. In fact, do you know that infants below the age of five kill more people than all Muslim terrorists combined in the world? Go back and look at the data of how many people, young children, have killed because there are guns in their houses, mostly accidentally, but killed, nevertheless. It's just the classification which makes us look like a moral society and others as an immoral society. So finally, what do we do? There are two things to do. Do we look at this as a geopolitical thing and blame Islam for the geopolitical context out there? Every policy that begins with that premise, I guarantee you, will fail because it will not address the reasons why there is that violence. But if we ask ourselves, why is there violence? And we begin from that question, then I think we will be able to find answers. We will not like some of those answers. Because we are going to find the culpability of our own policies in that. So let me tell you that there are a wide range of Muslims. There are Muslims who have given you the divine poetry of Rumi with which we started the forum today. They have given you Taj Mahal. The reason why Muslims are able to do that is because when they read their Quran, they are able to absorb the eternal beauty in it, and these are pathetic attempts to manifest that. Thank you.